Matthew 5, 21 to 48. We're going to read the whole passage. Jesus uh, is the one speaking. You've heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin, but anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still with him on the way or he may hand you over to the judge and the judge may hand you over to the officer and you may be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth, you'll not get out until you have paid the last penny. You've heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness causes her to become an adulteress and anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you've heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you've made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it's God's throne, or by the earth, for it's his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes, and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. You've heard that it was said eye for eye and tooth for tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also, and if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to read to you uh, from an opinion piece by Michael Jensen in the latest Eternity newspaper uh, from March 2019. Is the Sermon on the Mount even humanly possible? In the Russian winter of 1910, one of the greatest novelists the world has ever known, Count Leo Tolstoy, wandered out into the cold night, contracted pneumonia and died at a railway station at the age of 82. His death came only a few days after he'd determined to give up his aristocratic lifestyle, including his vast estates, and live a life he thought was consistent with Jesus' teachings in the Sermon on the Mount. After writing his great works, Anna Karenina and War and Peace, Tolstoy decided that he was going to follow what he thought were the true teachings of Jesus as contained in the Sermon on the Mount. For Tolstoy, the Gospels were the heart of the Bible. The Sermon on the Mount was at the heart of the Gospels. As one writer said, Tolstoy boiled down the essence of what he thought Christianity was to obeying the five commands of Christ in Matthew 5, 21 to 48. If people would genuinely fulfil these commands, then the kingdom of God would be activated on earth. It's a good question, isn't it? Can you actually live the Sermon on the Mount? Or if you boil it down even further, what are we to do with this part of the Bible? Some, like Tolstoy, understood that it was a series of five key commands that you could meet from Jesus in that sense, it becomes a new set of the Ten Commandments, 
a standard you can reach. And once you've reached it, you activate the kingdom of God in this world and you become a citizen of it. Others see the Sermon on the Mount more like a mirror. It's put there on the wall of life. You look into it, you see your own sin and you utterly despair. Faced by your own sin, you're driven to Jesus and off you go as a people of grace, never reading the Sermon on the Mount ever again. Perhaps we might be like some of those who regard the sermon as for the elite Christians. After all, Jesus was giving it to the twelve. We, the crowd, were just listening in. It's for those elite Christians, the super spiritual people, to keep. The rest of us are just going to muddle along in mud puddles. You might treat it like others who bring their cherry picker along and they choose certain areas to listen to and others to sidestep. So we won't take oaths, but we like both our hands, or reverse. We don't like our hands, but we're willing to take oaths. Some just ignore the whole thing entirely and skip to chapter 9 and off we go because it's too lofty for real life. Now, whichever way you look at it, it's a pretty majestic passage, isn't it? I mean, imagine if this could actually take place. Imagine if there were people who could control their anger and lust. Imagine if there were people who were generous, who kept their promises, who told the truth, who loved everyone. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Wouldn't it be wonderful? You see, on the one hand, it's a majestic passage. On the other hand, it's a fairly blunt passage, isn't it? Uh, on the one hand, it's a passage that deals with the stuff we face in everyday life, anger, lust, uh, lies, revenge. Uh, on the other hand, it transcends all of life as we've ever experienced it, doesn't it? On the one hand, the picture is so lovely that sometimes when you read it, you can ache for the desire of living in it. And on other hands, it is so sharp because it exposes every shadow in every crevice of your own heart. So what do we do with it? The Sermon on the Mount, especially this bit. Oh, I'm not going to suggest that we wander around in the snow and die at a railway station. I think that's a misunderstanding. I think Tolstoy misunderstood it. So what are we going to do with it? Well, let me give you what I think is the big idea and then I think it's wise that I pray and then we're going to dive into it together. Uh, let me suggest to you what I think Jesus is doing here. Jesus is commanding his disciples, the citizens of God's kingdom, to bear the family likeness. Jesus is commanding his disciples, the citizens of God's kingdom, to bear the family likeness, to be in God's family because they're connected to Jesus who fulfills everything God said. Let me pray and then we're going to see if that makes sense. Dear God, thanks for your word. As we've been reminded by Graham this morning, we sit here today in great comfort, in great luxury, with great privilege. We pray that we will not be enslaved by mammon or apathy. We pray that we will not be lazy with the truth. We pray that by your spirit, you'll bring us to a true poverty of heart, a true connectedness to Jesus. And because of these two things, a true obedience of displaying your nature of grace to this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Jesus is gathered with his closest followers on that hilltop, isn't he? Uh, there's Jesus, the 12, the crowd. Uh, he started to gather his disciples to call them, to command them to follow him. Uh, while he's there, we know, as Matthew has painted the picture, that God promised him to deal with the broken nature of the world. God promised him as the king who would rule rightly and God promised that he would be the one to deal with human sin. We've seen his method to proclaim and practice, to prepare for the kingdom coming, to encourage, command people to repent. We've seen that he's the only human who can ever tell the devil to go away. We see that he started to gather some of his people together. This is his first teaching session. Uh, it's known as the Sermon on the Mount and he set out the attributes of being a citizen in God's kingdom and that att those attributes start with, with what key characteristic? Can anyone remember? Verse 3, poor in spirit, poor in spirit. 
knowing the true nature of your heart so you become connected to Jesus. And those people are people who are salt and light in the world, displaying the character of God. Citizenship's not established on behaviour but on poverty, on being connected to a man who is everything we are not. And that man, as we learned last week, that man Jesus is the fulfilment of the pattern, the plan and the promise of God. He completes what God has promised and he sets the agenda for the rest of history. Now, even just summarising the first five chapters of Matthew's Gospel in that one paragraph, there's a fair bit there, isn't there? There's a fair bit there. It's kind of a part of the Bible that you really just want to sit, this is a gratuitous plug for Bible study groups, by the way, kind of a part of the Bible that you want to just sit and talk about with other people. Because we're not going to cover every word in what we're about to look at now, are we? On the one hand, we've got to keep in mind some big picture ideas. We'll come to that in a moment. You'll see it on your outline. Big concepts, big structures. What does it mean to be perfect? What does it mean to call God your father? What does it mean to be righteous? On the other hand, we've got to deal with some small picture ideas. All those quotations from the Old Testament, the fact that this is happening under Roman oppression, uh, all the cultural practices that go with it. And we're doing those two things, sitting in a drought-stricken town after a state election, tired and worried. So we're going to bring all these three things together, don't we, to work out what's going on here. And that's what we're going to try and do this morning. But let's start with the big picture. Uh, the structure that goes around this, the infrastructure, if you like, of this passage is so important. The four verses that we looked at last week, Matthew 5, 17 to 20, are crucial for understanding these verses. As I said to the West, I hope no one went home and tried to run a four-minute mile last week, okay? But I hope you all went home and remembered that Jesus stands where in terms of history? Smack bang in the middle. Smack bang in the middle. Whatever has come before, he fulfills. And so you better listen as he talks about whatever is about to come. Being connected to him is the key for being in God's kingdom and it means that we have to understand God's law in a certain way. That God's law is about revealing God to God's people so God's people can reveal God to the world. And Jesus fulfills that. So what follows now, remember verse 19? Remember verse 19? Let me just read it for you. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Verse 19 talks about what Jesus is looking at here in verses 21 to 48. These are the commands. This is him explaining what it means to be connected to the bloke who fulfills the law. So as God's people today, like God's people everywhere, we know what it means to display God to the world. Now Jesus isn't doing this so we think he's a good and funky teacher. Though that's the conclusion at the end, isn't it? Jesus isn't doing this to show that he has nature and authority, though that is lying everywhere. Jesus isn't doing this to show his identity. Jesus is doing this teaching, these commands, because of verse 48, because of verse 48, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus is teaching here from God's law so that we know what it looks like to reflect our Father to the world. So we know what it looks like to reflect our Father to the world. This isn't a key performance indicator you have to tick off to get in. This is what you display once you are already in. Now, excuse me for an example, but I am so thankful my children bear their mother's likeness more than their father's. It's terrific. But let me tell you, there is nothing they do that will make them more gabbets. They're already gabbets. They've just got to live like it. That's the same with us. There is nothing more we can do, as we'll find out next week, that will make us more citizens of God's kingdom than being connected to Jesus. And if we're connected to Jesus, 
we're to show the family likeness. That's the big structure, the bookends, the, the kind of scaffolding. But if you notice, as I read, there were some little structures that came up again and again, weren't there? You'll see them there on your outline. There's six areas he looks at, and in each of them you had the same pattern, didn't you? You've heard that it was said, but I tell you that. You've heard that it was said, but I tell you that. You've heard that it was said, but I tell you that. And just look at verse 21. You've heard that it was said to the people long ago. Yeah, Jesus isn't taking issue with God's law, is he? Jesus is taking issue with how God's law has been taught. If you listen carefully to last week, Jesus doesn't have an issue with God's law. He fulfills it, doesn't he? So the issue is how the people up the front of the synagogue in the life of God's people have taught God's law. You've heard that it was said, but I tell you, I'm the fulfilment, Jesus is saying. I'm everything the law pointed to, so let me tell you what it looks like to know the character of God. It's pretty radical, isn't it, in the true sense of the word radical? It gets to the root of the issue. It's countercultural in every culture. It's the fulfilment that displays the true character of God. The last thing before we dive into it is we've got to be aware of the language because the language, to put it simply, is fairly colourful, isn't it? Uh, Jesus creates some sermon illustrations here that I don't think I'd be game to use. The language is extreme, the images are extreme and constantly Jesus is throwing out verbal and theological hand grenades. We've got to tread carefully with the language because if we don't, we might misapply it. For example, in that section on oaths and telling the truth, we might think the issue is whether or not you take an oath and forget that it's actually an illustration about telling the truth. So let's not mistake the illustrations or the examples for the part of the character of God that Jesus is illustrating as we go through it. Right, let me just summarise where we've been because we need a breather, don't we? Let me just summarise where we've been and then we're going to dive into these six areas very quickly. Just imagine this is how Jesus might have summarised it in Bernard's language. You are in God's kingdom because through the poverty of your own spirit, you know your sin. And because of that, you're connected to Jesus who is everything that God's law is about. That means you're God's people. And that means that your job in this world is to display the character and nature of God. Let me tell you what that looks like. Well, what does it look like? We're at point two on the outline. Uh, there are six areas. Uh, you see them there listed. I'm not going to tell you the verse numbers. Uh, in each, we saw that structure. You've heard that it was said, but I tell you. You've heard that it was said, but I tell you. As Jesus unpacks the fulfillment of God's law. Uh, let, let's start there in verse 21. You've heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. That's fairly clear, isn't it? Well, it's just a sixth commandment, really. If there are no shallow graves in the backyard and no weapons in the shed with blood, then this has been upheld, hasn't it? Well, that's the surface teaching that had become the standard. Look what Jesus says in verse 22. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. You see, the issue isn't that there's an absence of shallow graves or weapons. The issue is, what do you do with your anger? That self-absorbed, self-focused, self-righteous anger. Anger. In that sense, the absence of a corpse or a weapon is nothing. The state of your heart is everything. And how many relationships does Jesus say are exempt from this? Well, no relationship. This happens within the kingdom and as the kingdom relates to people outside the kingdom. Notice Jesus doesn't talk about righteous anger because he knows that that's pretty rare for us. 
But it's even more than this because in verse 23, Jesus changes, doesn't he? Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. You see, that's different, isn't it? That's not about controlling your anger, but it's about the fact that you've made someone else angry. That your conduct, your behaviour, your heart has damaged a relationship with someone else. And Jesus says, be the first to initiate restoration. You be the one to build the bridge and you be the one to get over it in order to restore relationship with someone else. Leave your name tag at the door, go and meet them, be restored with them and then come. Jesus not only commands his disciples to control their own anger, he commands them to initiate restoration with others they have caused to be angry. It's a command of being patient and gentle and self-controlling, a command to be merciful and kind and generous, a command to self-denial and restoration. Well, the standard teaching on adultery was pretty simple too, wasn't it? Verse 27, you've heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. Again, straight from the commandments, isn't it? Pretty simple idea. Just don't sleep with someone else's marriage partner. Again, Jesus blows that out of the water. Verse 28, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. The issue is not whether you've booked a weekend away. The issue is what your heart is doing. That seat of your emotion and passion and desire and priority. What is your heart doing? That's why we had that reading from Mark 7, because out of the heart will flow what? All the sewer. Adultery is not so much about who you sleep with as who you lust after. Who you look at as someone who's an object for your pleasure and that's adultery. Now in case we think Jesus is being a little too high and mighty, in case we think this is a topic to treat lightly, in fact this whole section, look at what he says in verse 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. This is about sin, isn't it? The attitude and action that says, I am God and God is not. And sin is serious, not just because of what it is. That's serious enough but because of where it leads. Sin leads to hell. Sin leads to hell. And so Jesus says, take preventative action. He uses an extreme example, doesn't he? Don't confuse the example with the point. Oregon did. Oregon's one of the church fathers. There's a few areas I'll disagree with Oregon on, but perhaps this is one area. He made himself a eunuch. He mistook the example for the point. Sin is serious. Take preventative action. And as we do, reflect how pure God is. It's no mistake that Jesus then goes on in verse 31 to talk about marriage and to talk about the standard teaching, which had taken a concession from God because God knows how poor our hearts are. And God had given a concession because he knew the way humans work. And the humans had taken that concession and made it a rule and then made it easy. So easy that if you think in modern day standards, you could go down to the news agents and pick up your tax file declaration number and a divorce certificate if you wanted, if you found something displeasing. 
divorce was easy and simple. Now, Jesus teaches more on this in Matthew 19. But do you notice how seriously he takes what it means to be married? And how extensive the damage of divorce extends? And while he doesn't explicitly say it, I suspect Jesus is saying here, treat marriage the way God treats marriage with his people. He is unfailingly committed to the promises he has made. And so his people reflect that. Well, that moves neatly into the section on oaths, which is really a section about truth. And in those days, the standard teaching was, if you swore an oath by God or by anything connected with God, they're the ones you keep. The others, they're flexible. (laughs) They're flexible. You can get out of those ones. Now, let's be clear, Jesus is not against vows or oaths. God makes promises, vows, oaths and covenants, Deuteronomy 10.20, and there's one about a rainbow in Genesis 9, 9 to 11, isn't there? So the issue isn't whether you make promises and oaths and vows and covenants. The issue is how flexible are you with the truth? And God's word's pretty simple, isn't it? He says yes and it's yes and he says no and it's no. The reverse or the opposite is pretty sober, isn't it? Anything beyond this comes from the devil. That's pretty simple, isn't it? God is the God of truth. The devil is the purveyor of lies. He moves then, verse 38 to 42, into revenge. You've heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth again. This is the standard teaching that's taken what God has said and perverted it. God does say similar things, doesn't he? He does it in order to limit revenge because he knows what I'm like. You take my eye, I'll take your whole body. He knows what I'm like. I'm wealthy so I can afford to get revenge. You're poor, so bad luck. So God brings in an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth to limit my revenge and to allow justice for the poor and the oppressed. And humans have taken that and written themselves a blank check to take back what's been taken from them. How does the fulfilment of Jesus look? Well, did you notice there that Jesus commands when you are personally insulted, when you are personally abused, Jesus commands exceeding generosity and restraint. Instead of a punch back, put your hand down and turn your cheek. Instead of assembling a legal team, give generously. Instead of resistance, act with self-sacrificial generosity. Instead of asking, well, what did you do with the money you received this week? Be merciful and give wisely and generously. Which brings us to verses 43 to 47 with the teaching about love. The standard teaching was pretty clear. Love your neighbour, hate your enemies. That's pretty easy. And it fails completely to reflect the character and nature of God. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. When the drought breaks, where will it rain? Everywhere. When the sun came up this morning, did it come up just in Dewhurst Street? It came up on every house in Narrabah. That is the way God treats a world that hates him, that lives in active rebellion against him, that is populated by humans who desire his throne. He expects his people to show the same lack of discrimination when it comes to generosity. to love all people and to pray for all people. Now, that's been a bit of a whirlwind, hasn't it? A kind of cook's tour on fast forward of the commands of Jesus. He stands smack bang in the middle of history, 
fulfilling the law and the prophets, bringing them to their logical conclusion and revealing the pattern, plan and purpose and nature of God. And he shows his disciples what that looks like as he tears back the standard teaching of the day. And he does it against the background of verse 19. These are commands to be treasured and taught. Whatever else is going on here, we have a revelation of the character of God, don't we? I'm at point three on the outline. God is self-controlled. God is faithful in what he says and in all his relationships. He does what he means and speaks. God is generous and kind and merciful in the way in which he deals with every part of creation. If you were to summarise the nature of God revealed here, I think you could summarise it as gracious, couldn't you? God is full of grace, bestowing on others what they do not deserve. In that sense, the fulfilment of the law by Jesus is about grace, bestowing on rebellious humans what they do not deserve. And in that sense... A life of God's people is to be a life of grace to everyone. If God is gracious in his dealings with all people, then surely his people must be gracious in their dealings with all people, giving what is not deserved. We go well with that, don't we? In that sense, the fulfilment of the law by Jesus as he reveals the character of God should bring us up short, shouldn't it? <laughs> we do not bear the family likeness well left to our own devices. And I think this is the purpose on one level of what Jesus is doing here because it returns us all the way back to verse 3, doesn't it? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You cannot read this as a disciple of Jesus, perhaps even just a human being, and not know that you fail, that you do not measure up to the character of God and we're made in the image of God. It is worked in such a way that poverty of spirit in our heart is the outcome that is desired on one level so that we go back where? To the one man who can look the devil in the eye and tell him to go away. To be connected to him, to Jesus, to bring us into the family. Which brings us back to where we started. What do we do with all this stuff? Well, to be blunt, if we're connected to Jesus... We do it, don't we? We obey it. We are to be people renowned, known, savoured, understood everywhere for our grace. For our grace. Because we know the poverty of our hearts, so we are connected to Jesus so we display the family likeness. If we're not connected to Jesus, can I ask you why not? Why aren't we connected to Jesus? It can't be that we read those verses and go, I can do that. Because we can't. Our only hope at this point is to be connected to the one bloke who shows the image of God perfectly, and that is Jesus Christ. Let me pray. Dear God, thank you for your word. Thank you for Jesus, who displays your likeness perfectly, who perfectly confronts the devil, who perfectly fulfills your promises and plans and practices and patterns. It teaches us to be perfect because we're connected to him. Father, help us to know the poverty of our spirits, to throw ourselves upon the trust 
of Jesus and what he has done and who he is and to display the nature of you as our Father in this world, the Father who is gracious. In Jesus' name, amen.